case, my name is Kortzik. Uh, I'm one of the investor and rental docs at Kaiser Los Angeles uh, here at KP Visla. And uh, they tasked me with the topic of genicular organ embolization and the setting of knee osteoarthritis. So like I said, um, it's been interesting. It's kind of something cool about our field is you often learn to do things you'd actually never learned in training. And so this wasn't something I really learned in training, but have had the opportunity to help learn and grow as a part of faculty. So, you know, what's great about being in this space when we look at, you know, what disease process you want to be a part of is with osteoarthritis, it's a high incidence disease entity and also it's highly prevalent. But lastly, you know, it can have high morbidity. A lot of patients that suffer from osteoarthritis are quite debilitated by it and really severely affected by it uh, beyond just pain. And so, you know, being able to be part of this and help them with that is really a unique opportunity. But to really be involved with, you know, GAE or osteoarthritis, we really have to take a step back and understand knee pain and really figure out what's causing this patient's knee pain. And there's a multitude of structures intrinsically and even outside of the knee that we have to kind of keep in mind, you know, is it related to ligamentous injury? And you, oftentimes a history and a good physical can help, you know, rule out a lot of these causes and confirm what your suspicion is that this is all related to arthritis or, you know, is this meniscus or oftentimes it could be a referred from like the hip or the IT band. So really taking time in my initial evaluation and kind of talking to them to figure out that is this all related to just OA or is there something else that could be contributing you know, to their pain or disability that I'm better suited to either treat or refer out for. And you know, when we think about the knee pain, okay, we decide it's related to arthritis. Now you're seeing this patient in clinic and you wanna make sure before you offer any kind of management from an interventional standpoint that you've exhausted all their options before. So when you look at some of the, you know, guideline directed therapies across some of the major, uh, you know, parties that are involved, including rheumatology, orthopedics, um, and ORSI, which is a kind of dedicated osteoarthritic group, uh, you see that the number one kind of recommended thing is weight loss across the board. Uh, and on top of that is physical, ex uh, physical exercise, um, and physical therapy. Some of the things I kind of learned as I learned about this disease process, you know, something like Tai Chi, a lot of people recommend, um, and balance exercises and whatnot. Um, TENS is something that isn't as strongly recommended. A lot of these, you know, are built on what has really good data and what doesn't. And so you see these patients and, you know, most of the time they've already attempted weight loss or, you know, they're not re uh, resolving with physical therapy or aren't improving on it despite, you know, adequate physical therapy. And so you say, okay, what do we do next? And that's when you know, you're doing oral therapy or intraarticular therapy. And the mainstay of oral therapy is NSAIDs, um, as well as you know, oral and topical NSAIDs. Now, the thing with NSAIDs, you know, a lot of patients can't tolerate them, or they have other medical reasons why they cannot be prescribed NSAIDs. And so it's not something that's available for, available for everyone. But when they can, you know, NSAIDs is what I usually will recommend first. Uh, the other thing, if they're going to try something pill-wise, you could do Tylenol or non tram or sorry tramadol non tramadol opioids is actually something i don't advise patients to rely on uh the american college of uh, rheumatology they do have conditional recommendation for duloxetine i personally have not started anyone on it yet but it is something that i keep in the back of my mind um, and see if that's something you know patient would be recommended for now when it comes to intra articular injections steroids are kind of also the workhorse there there are other agents out there like hyaluronic acid, you know, PRP stem cell, uh, but the data on that isn't as well validated and, you know, isn't as strongly recommended. We do at our uh, institution do both uh, hyaluronic acid and PRP injections. Um, and I've seen kind of mixed results with patients, but again, it's not something that is as well validated, but, you know, you want to ask yourself, is it always what's best for the patient, right? Because that's ultimately what we're doing this. We want to help these patients through this disease and their illness. And this is an interesting paper that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020, comparing physical therapy and steroid injections, really showing that one year, uh, there's really no difference in patients who underwent physical therapy in terms of pain and disability when you compare it to steroid injections. And it's something that, you know, we often see, and when we look at some of the other data, uh, you know, the other data in our field, like for example, the clever trial for PAD, we saw, you know, exercise really just as good as stenting. And so, you know, something we have to keep in mind, and that's where I spend a lot of my time with these patients is counseling them about these options before I take them to do a procedure. But now I've decided, okay, they've, you know, kind of exhausted some of all these other options. What can I do to help, right? That's where, you know, we can come in. So what is embolization of the knee and, you know, why does it happen? So when you have patients who have some of the earlier stages of arthritis, there's inflammation in the synovium leading to angiogenesis. And this inflammation 
inflammatory markers are then kind of released and that in turn results in pain. Uh, and what you have to realize about arthritis, which you know I didn't really know until I started getting more involved with it is it's not a wear and tear disease, which I was you know often taught, but it's actually a imbalance of the catabolic process and an anabolic process with the catabolic factors far outweighing the anabolic ones resulting in a net destruction. So when I'm seeing these patients, I kind of risk stratifying using the Womack uh, questionnaire. I like it because you can get a sense of, you know, how much pain they have with certain activities, as well as, you know, how affected they are by stiffness and kind of how limited they are doing things every day. Uh, so for example, if you look at the first part related to pain, you can see, you know, how often do they have pain going up or downstairs, you know, whether they're sitting or lying or even standing upright. And then, you know, with regards to stiffness, you kind of want to know, is it in the morning, later in the day, how long does it last? And that's kind of against a, a sense of, you know, is this related to osteoarthritis or is there some inflammatory component to arthritis? And that kind of helps me there as well. And then lastly, uh, you know, the disability part of it, you know, how difficult is it for them to do things like going shopping or, you know, taking off your socks or putting on stockings. So this really gives me a sense of how bothered, you know, is this patient? Because, you know, ultimately that's my goal. This is not a curative procedure. It's me to help, you know, palliate them. The other thing I do is get a two digit visual analog score. So this is a 10 centimeter line and I have them draw a line in terms of how severe their pain is. And I measure it and convert that from centimeters to a two digit, basically a visual analog score. And then they're also usually by then have had some form of weight bearing radiographs. And that allows me to risk stratify their disease radiographically. So, you know, how severe is it in terms of joint space narrowing, as well as, you know, osteophytosis and whatnot. So now you've decided, okay, this patient, you know, somebody who I want to do genicular artery embo on, what do I do or where do I go? And so having a thorough knowledge of the anatomy, of the knee joint and arterial supply is key. And so luckily there are people who've been doing this, you know, for years and kind of teased a lot of this out, but the main arteries that we kind of target is there's the descending geniculer for the medial joint, and then there's a superior and inferior medial geniculars. And when it comes to the lateral aspect, there's the superior and inferior uh, lateral geniculars, and then the recurrent anterior tibial artery. And you can even have some anterior joint supply um, and whatnot. And then basically kind of using those combinations and figuring out where exactly their pain is, I target those arteries based on that. And so when we look at some of the data, um, there's a lot kind of out there, but I'll touch on a little bit just for the sake of time. In 2015 was the first time it was done by Dr. Akuno in Japan. And so they used uh, artery embolization in the setting of OA. It had always been done for hemarthrosis, but this is the first time kind of published in the setting of OA. And so those patients had pretty severe pain. Uh, they were resistant to, you know, it was considered conservative therapy, meaning injections, therapy, um, as well as uh, physical therapy. And radiographically, their disease was not quite that severe. And also because it was an Asian population, there was a pretty low amount. The overall BMI was not as high as we've seen in some of the studies coming out of America or Europe. But the relevance of this, it was the first study that really showed efficacy short-term as well as you know, good durability in the short-term. And then it was interesting, the patients uh, decreased their NSAID use as well as any subsequent intra-articular injection requirements. So that was pretty cool. And then you kind of fast forward to 2021, which is one of the first uh, major randomized controlled trials that was published by Dr. Bagua and their team comparing GAE to a sham procedure, which when you're involved with pain, you know, people talk about the importance of a sham trial and showing that the effects of your procedure are real and not related to placebo. And so these are patients who are randomized to a sham or GAE and kind of assessed at one month. And you can see both at the visual analog scale as well as their WOMAC questionnaire, there's a significant decrease in that one month that they didn't see in the sham. And then the sham group kind of crossed over. We saw similar positive results for them when they got the procedure, kind of further supporting our procedure and its you know, efficacy. And then these are kind of some of the big papers. Uh, and when you look at the WOMAC response, you see in that first month, a nice, great decrease, as well as fairly durable and sustained response almost out to 12 to 24 months. Um, similar findings within the visual analog scale. Uh, there's another questionnaire called the Kusk uh, questionnaire that you know, some of the European papers have talked about. It's kind of similar to the WOMAC, uh, but they also showed the same findings. Now, uh, this is a patient of mine. He had tried a myriad of intraarticular injections as well as kind of topical oral NSAIDs. Um, and then we decided ultimately, you know, we felt his pain was related to OA. It was all medial joint line pain. So radiographically, his disease wasn't as severe, but he was really debilitated. His WOMAC was in the 70s. Visual analog pain scare uh, was also in the 70s. And so, you know, we talked about his option, decided to treat. 
He had had an MRI for other reasons, and you can see the joint diffusion as well as synovial kind of thickening. Um, this is non-contrast, but you know, it suggests he does have a level of synovitis. He had a prior medial meniscal tear, and then you can see some chondromalacia uh, changes in his medial femoral compartment. Uh, so overall, I felt he would be a great candidate. Uh, so the way I do these, I usually do anti-grade access um, on the ipsilateral limb, and then we'll get a five French catheter down. I do a digital subtraction angiogram. Uh, some Dr. Padia and their group, you know, published some really compelling information regarding the use of cone beam CT to help really identify which arteries you need to embolize with. Uh, we do it kind of mixed sometimes, uh, but I don't routinely do it. And then, so he had medial pain. And we also put a BB kind of uh, in pre-op where their pain is. I haven't point to it. I put a BB there uh, just to help kind of correlate further. And so for him, we did a descending genicular superior and inferior medial genicular artery embo. And so this blush you see, the synovium is what we kind of prune. I use a permanent embolic. We use little tiny microscopic 100 micron uh, embozine particles. And then he did well. His uh, Womack score came down to the 30s and his visual analog as well. And he, I saw him recently for a six month follow up and he's doing great. Um, he was recently in the Midwest kind of helping his son retool their shed. Uh, and so he was really happy with the results. Um, so where does GAE fit in kind of the big picture, right? We know there's lifestyle modifications and, you know, quote unquote, conservative therapy, but oftentimes patients who are refractory to all that would see a surgeon and be told, hey, you're not quite at surgery yet, or hey, let's try to kick the can as far down the road as we can. So, you know, I call these people in osteoarthritic limbo. And I think that's where we can provide quite a lot of value. And, you know, is there a question for us even being involved earlier? I don't think the data is there, but it'd be, you know, something compelling to kind of look into. But for those people in OA limbo, I think we can really provide a great service. Uh, and so right now, you know, kind of the ideal patient doesn't tend to be morbidly obese. They tend to have kind of, you know, either a unilateral disease, meaning their pain is either medial or more lateral or anterior. Radiographically isn't as bad. Um, and they have, you know, pretty symptomatic pain scores and they have failed conservative therapy. Um, now, with regards to kind of, you know, the more severe disease on imaging, you know, and Dr. Padia and their group kind of published some stuff with people who have more severe radiographic disease. And so there may even be a role of patients who have, you know, pretty advanced disease. So there's some more trials coming out that I'm really excited to, you know, learn from and hear about. But for now, I think this is kind of how I'm selecting. Now, you know, as with anything in, you know, our field, oftentimes we'll come up with this great therapy or procedure, and we learn that other, you know, especially other people are, quote unquote, taking or doing it for whatever reason. And I think one of the big reasons for that is, you know, we have to showcase that we own the disease, we know the patients, we should be the people who should be referred first, and we kind of quarterback before. So oftentimes, you know, the referrals come from primary care, they're seeing either, you know, PM and our pain medicine doctor who then sends to orthopedics and they're in like limbo. And sometimes we're getting referred in after that for this patients. Whereas I think what we need to transform is to go from primary care, then they come to us and we basically evaluate and then quarterback from there and say, Hey, maybe you should go see one of our colleagues, either, you know, pain medicine. If there's something that we don't feel like we can offer, you can't offer, um, or orthopedics, you know, if it's time for a joint replacement. And by doing this, we can create a really sustainable referral pattern and continue to own, you know, this, this procedure and this disease. Because, you know, there are people out there that are, you know, outside of our field that are doing it. I know local vascular surgeons within Los Angeles who are doing it. I've heard about, you know, in New York, there's people, uh, you know, within neurosurgery who, you know, are trying to take this uh, or take over, you know, genicular artery embo. So it's not something that, you know, is exclusive to us, but if we want to be the main players in it, I think, you know, owning the disease and restructuring the referral pattern is going to be a huge, huge win for us in the long run. So in summary, GA is a safe, minimally invasive therapy, uh, you know, for mild, moderate, maybe even severe OA, very safe, you know, minimal adverse events, and it's fairly durable in terms of efficacy and a great option we can now start offering to our patients. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, open to any questions. Here's my number and you can email me as well at any time.